You're listening to season three of the TalentWorks podcast, an interview series with digital talent brought to you by Helen O'Donnell and me, Brona Monaghan. Each week, Helen and I speak to the best in the business when it comes to digital talent. Here at BBC Studios, it's our job to discover and nurture the next generation of talent who've built their audiences online and are evolving and innovating the media landscape as we know it. Our guest this week is Phil Lester, and this episode was recorded at VidCon London. Over to Helen to make the intro. I'm Helen O'Donnell. I'm Head of Development for TalentWorks, which is part of BBC Studios, and I'm here with Brona Monaghan, who also works in the development team. So we're a part of BBC Studios, the production part of the BBC, which forms a bridge between online creators and traditional media, so like ourselves. But enough about us, we're here to talk to Phil, which we're so excited and honoured to have with us. So Phil started creating content in 2006 from his bedroom in Lancashire and now has over a billion views. These viewers are from all over the world and they come to his quirky and beautiful comedic videos. <laughs> Alongside his friend and longtime collaborator Dan Howell, Phil has many accolades under his belt. So. I don't know whether we maybe want to ah or ooh when I talk about these. <laughs> Please but do. He was a Radio 1 DJ. All right. New York Times and Sunday Times best-selling author. TV presenter. <laughs> and his creative spirit, spirit has been shown in numerous successful projects, including an app store topping app, a hit board game, two global tours, and two books. I think that almost deserves a round of applause. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks, guys. My head's not going to fit through the door in <laughs> So, us at BBC Studios, we've worked uh, with Phil in 2018 on the filming and distribution of his live tour, Interactive Introverts, which included a Twitter live stream premiere in Brazil, which was exciting. So what we're going to talk about now is Phil's creative process, where you get your inspiration from, and how you find collaborating. That's all right? Sure. And we're recording this for a podcast as well, aren't we're we? We're recording it for a podcast. Yeah. So if you don't get enough enjoyment in the room, you can listen to it again. Yeah. I should have come in my pajamas if we're just recording for the podcast. Exactly. We're, yeah. we're chilled. I'm used to be on camera. <laughs> yeah. So, Phil, um, there's been quite a few sort of talks whilst we're here at VidCon about data, but I mean, predominantly BBC Studios comes from a creative standpoint. So yes. I'd love to talk about when did you first realize that you were creative? Ooh, I think I just came out of the womb and did jazz hands <laughs> in the hospital. No, um, I think I've always been quite a creative person. Like when I was about eight years old, I got given a video camera from my parents uh, for Christmas. And I just made little films with my friends and horror films. I made one when I was 10 called The Madness of Matthew Swazak. And he was like one of my friends. And we were literally running down the street in scream masks and scary monster costumes with a knife and the <laughs> and filming it and the neighbors were like what is going on outside and then we had ketchup for fake blood and even then i was learning to edit by pausing a video cassette tape and then like putting the footage in from the camera and editing in real time before you could even do it on a computer so i think i've been making videos since i was able to make videos which says something i don't really know where that creativity came from like I just had this inspiration. I was like, I want to make something. I think it was just from watching TV and movies. And I'd watched movies hundreds of times, like Gremlins 1. I'd watched so many times I broke the cassette just because I loved the film so much. And I just thought, I want to make something like this or my own version of entertainment, even if it's just going to be three friends that end up watching it. Well, that's quite yeah. an interesting point because I, I was going to ask, was there a person who creatively inspired you you know did you have a mentor gizmo up? the gremlin okay. yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not really a mentor i think it, i'm thankful to my parents who would let me just do this like i do my homework but then they would just say okay you can you can go for it i'll get your video camera if you want to make videos and not everyone has that uh, means of doing it i think now it's changed because everyone's got a mobile phone so anyone could make a video if they wanted to just with a, a phone recording and when you were yeah. making those films, did you have sort of an outlet to put them somewhere? Who were, who were your audience? Was it your family or? It, it, it was basically just my family or the the horror film that I made with my friends. I played it at school because it had oh. some of my school friends in it. And the teachers were like, okay, sure. We don't want to do the lesson. Let's just watch this for 10 minutes. And I think having that audience reaction, I was like, oh, people are actually laughing and enjoying it. And that inspired me to maybe want to make some other things as well. And then at TalentWorks, one of, one of our main sort of 
things that we look for are, are storytellers. And I think that YouTube as a platform was sort of the most purest form to kind of express anything that you wanted to express. Was, was that what drew you to YouTube initially? Um, I think so. It was. I've been on YouTube since 2006, and I think it started in 2004 or five. So I've been there pretty much since the start. And I was just impressed by the fact that anyone anywhere could make something and you'd have a place to broadcast yourself. And that was so exciting to me. So I saw like Smosh, I saw Lonely Girl 15, who was like one of the first YouTubers I watched and she turned out to be fake and it wasn't real. And that was a whole thing. You should Google it if you've not seen it, it was crazy. And other just YouTubers, and they, they weren't even recording anything that interesting, but I was just interested in seeing a little snippet of someone else's life in Canada or Australia. So I posted my video um, just thinking, you know, I'm gonna give this a go. If these people can do it, why can't this guy in Lancashire up north do it? So I recorded one and I was like, I've got two comments. This is crazy. Pe like two people, one in Australia and one somewhere else actually cares about what I've got to say. And I think it's just that little boost just inspired me to do it more. And as long as I found it fun, I just kept doing it. And obviously yeah. that, that comes from like a community standpoint. And yeah. I think when VidCon first started, it was really kind of the first sort of it, the conceptualizing in real life that community. How did you feel the first time that you went to VidCon? Oh my gosh, the first time. Oh, I, I can't think when that was. It was VidCon LA. Uh, it might have been the second or the third ever VidCon. And I think I felt a bit of imposter syndrome. I was like, do I deserve to be here with all of these other people and all these creators I look up to? And I remember going into some of the the parties. I was like, oh my God, Smosh is over there. I can't, I can't go, I can't be in the same room as them. So it was very much a learning experience. But then I'd see some of the audience there that had watched my videos and I'd never really, really been to America to like see people that had seen my videos and to have like a hundred people come to a panel or something else or a meet and greet, it was just crazy to me because you see all of these comments on YouTube and you don't expect them to be real people for some reason. So when I actually saw that, I was like, oh wow, this is this is real. This is something that's happening. Great, so yeah. you, from going from those like two comments yes. and thinking, oh my gosh, here are two people who want to engage with me, yeah. to now, how do you think you've maintained that trust with your audience? I, it's, it's a tough one. I think you'd have to ask the audience first of all, because they're, they're the ones that are still watching. But it's also, I think I am being me in the videos. So I think just because I'm being myself, I haven't felt the need to reinvent myself or pretend to be someone I'm not when making videos. And I think that might come across as someone that you can grow up with. So I've got people that will come up to me and they've been watching me for 10 years and they say, oh, I've grown up with your videos. And it's like, they feel like I'm kind of a friend, if that makes sense. So I think that's just the connection between me and the audience. Like I'm always replying to people on Twitter and it just feels like they're friends rather than it's like a, a fan situation. So I usually just say like audience or viewers. It still feels a bit strange to be like, oh, all my fans, you know? <laughs> so I think maybe that is something that helps with it. Yeah. yeah. So you have uh, your long-term collaborator, Dan Howell. Yes. How did it feel collaborating with somebody else? It's really refreshing to collaborate with someone else because especially in, in like a comedy video, it's just someone to like have ideas that you can go back and forth with. And also I think I work really well in an improvisation style environment. So especially when we did the gaming channel, like even if we're just reacting to video games, just having someone else there to like laugh with and when you're making the videos, like have like comedy banter with, um, it always helps. So I felt that was very helpful, but also very creative as well, like having someone else with other creative ideas. So you're not just in your head all the time, that really helps with just making this whole thing happen. Yeah, yeah, and you've transcended your YouTube channel. Transcended. <laughs> in terms of collaborating. So like the books, the yeah. games, the live shows. If we take the example of the live shows, yeah. how did the creative process of that work from the inception of we should go and do a live show? That was a huge leap because I, being on YouTube, hadn't really worked with a big group of people before. It's quite a lonely job sometimes because you are just on your own editing and and filming and doing everything yourself. So moving on to this live show idea, which was gonna be a huge production, like we were gonna have like about 10 crew, we were gonna to be touring the world, and we knew we wanted to do this huge thing, but it was such a big leap to have other voices saying, oh, I think you should do it this way, or I think you should do it that way, or why don't we try this, or that venue's too small, or that venue's too big. So it was just a learning curve to have a big group of people to collaborate with. But also, I'm quite a shy person, or I was, so going on stage in front of 
2,000 people was quite far out of my comfort zone compared to sitting in a room recording a video by myself. So it was kind of fighting off my anxiety and thinking, I can do this. These people are here to see me for a reason. So there's no reason to be worried about it in a way. So that was also a big leap for me to be able to get out there on stage and do it. So when you talk about, absolutely, there are more people involved than just yourself yes. and Dan with a live show. What qualities did you look for in like creative collaborators? Um, well, we met all of the, the crew and the people that we worked with. And we, we interviewed a few people that would like design the stage or help direct the show. And I think the collaborators would just have to be other creative people. And it really helped if they understood the internet as well. So we had a little interview. It was only like five minutes. We'd say, like, what's your favorite YouTube video? And some people would say, oh, I never go on YouTube. But if you're making a stage show all about YouTube, like the people who have that job, you want them to love and understand what it is that we're making. So that was one thing. But also some people that would be team players and they would have a laugh. Because if you're going to be on the road with people for three months, you want to be able to have a laugh and a joke and everyone to get along well. And thankfully, we had a great team. So it worked out and then the yeah. writing of the show so yes. the first show was incredible in terms of you know it sort of had songs in it it had narrative it had jokes it had mega costumes it was a whole it was a whole shebang so it was, <laughs> it was basically trying to turn everything people loved about our youtube videos into a stage show and how could that work also with a narrative flowing through the whole thing and we just wanted it to be something that was bigger than anyone had seen before from it, from YouTubers, basically. So there was a whole section where I had to learn magic. And thankfully, I've got a friend who's a stage magician. He's in The Illusionists at the moment. And he taught me like real stage magic. So that was part of it. And then we had other sections, which were like big stunts. And also there was a song and dance at the end, which if you know me, the concept of me doing a song and a dance is so far out of my comfort zone it's ridiculous you'll not be seeing me on Strictly anytime soon I'll, I'll tell you that much but yeah it was and a big challenge did, how did you find the process of doing it every night did it feel like there was because in the show there were parts improvised weren't there yeah the first show was more scripted than the second show but doing it every night I think the thing that brought us through it was those improvised moments but also the audiences were so incredible any moment in your head you might be like oh I'm a bit tired it'd just be completely erased by how excited people were to be watching the show. And also the feedback that you get every night was different. And even though it was like, I'd say the first one was about 70% scripted, you would change it up anyway based on what the audience were like or what the reactions were. Because like in America, people would find different jokes funny than the people in Sweden. So you'd just learn to change it and mold it anyway. So that was a really fun process. And did you learn anything about yourself as a performer or creative during that process? Um, I learned that I can actually firstly do scripted stuff because there were scripted sections. And I've always said, and you might have heard me say in my videos, oh, I can't act. I could never act. But even though I was playing myself, I was still going off script and people were laughing. So I was like, oh, OK, maybe that is something that I, I could do. And I, I don't think you should put yourself in a box where you're like, no, I can't do that because you're probably cutting off a lot of opportunities that because you've got an idea in your head that you can't do something when actually... If you give it a go, you might be better than you think. So that was that was one thing that was slightly out of my comfort zone, but it was okay. And Phil, you've obviously got experience in traditional broadcasting as well. Yes. How, how did that experience compare? Well, we had a Radio 1 show, which was three or four years. It started where we were just collaborating, like me and Dan were collaborating as YouTubers with Radio 1. And the people that we met we got talking and I think they saw something in us and the BBC were like actually why don't we give these guys a show because so many people are watching them and the people are watching these YouTube videos and they're getting good comments so the show came about by just like working with them it was kind of just like a little freelance basis and then we got the main show and I'd say the, the difference is it's live first of all so I do a bit of live stuff on like you now and live shows but this is bbc live so if you say something wrong then you've said it wrong so you really have to be aware of what you're saying but there's a whole art to it as well of working the desk and having the music in the background and knowing like when to dip that down when you're talking so it's kind of we were learning on the go and it was absolutely terrifying i think for the first three months of doing the radio shows i'd have 
like wake up in the middle of the night, <laughs> night sweat, <laughs> nightmares that I'd said something wrong or that my headphones had got really big. And I was just having these like panic dreams about the radio. Um, but we, we got into a flow with it. And I think it was a really entertaining radio show. And it was also in- innovative because we had people sending in music videos that they'd made at home. And then we would play them out on the radio on website. So I always like something that's innovative or pushing the boundaries of the technology. We were playing these off DVDs as well. That's how old school it was still at Radio 1. So at one time, if a DVD skipped or if a DVD broke, then the radio show would just go off air. So you'd have to have that kind of improvisational, okay, now I've got to say something funny because we've got two minutes to fill. So that was a good audition or something. That's probably not the right (laughs) word. But, you know, a, a good preparation for doing stuff on stage as well. Because, like, when we did the stage show, there was things that could go wrong. Like there was one show where there was a huge lightning storm in the middle of America and the show was mainly screen based, if you remember. So we were reacting to loads of stuff on the screen. The lightning hits, the screens all go off. And then we've got to do a show for an hour and 10 minutes without any of the content that we needed to do the show. Um, So what did you do? Well, that we, we kind of improvised it and based some of those bits that we knew were coming up in a more unplugged fashion like a bit more cut and paste but then the people that went to that show were like oh that was so fun we got a special we got the special version <laughs> and I was like oh I'm good I'm glad you took that out of it rather than anything else and what do you think that traditional broadcasters could sort of learn from digital natives you know because I sort of think mm. that podcasting has had a real sort of boom because it is a bit more free-flowing yes I think I think that is a good thing like free-flowing and not having so many restrictions because when we were working on the radio, every, like so many ideas had to go through about 10 processes of we need to go through this, we need to check this, we need to check that, we need to check this is okay. And by the time you've gone through these 10 steps of checking, kind of the fun of the creativity has gone a bit. So I think it's, it's not about breaking the rules. It's just about trying to be more improvisational and spontaneous where you can. And not everything needs signing off by five different people before you, you know, tell a joke. Yeah, it yeah. can sometimes feel, as somebody who works in traditional media, yeah. when you're excited at the beginning, it's like, oh, you've, you've literally just, like, hit everything fun out of this idea. <laughs> and now we're sort of left with sort of a dead little corpse of what could have been fun. Yeah, so... <laughs> the dead corpse. I'm not, so I'm not, I'm not sure in traditional media how that could work, but I know, like, if someone's working on a TV show, that when they've started, it's going to be three years later for when people are going to see it. So I think it's just a different mindset whilst the thing I love about YouTube is I could make a video today and everyone's going to see it today and that's more fresh but you can also be more reactive to things like pop culture or stuff that's going on and it will feel fresher than some ideas that you'll see now coming out on TV like you might have seen on a Netflix show people are doing like the floss dance as a joke which was funny last year Mm. but now they wrote that last year and now it's on TV it's just you're a bit like "Eh, okay that would have been funnier a year ago so it's about maybe predicting predicting what's going to be funny next year I don't know (laughs) yeah but also then in the defense of traditional media it's sometimes nice bringing like voices that maybe you wouldn't normally collaborate with um together to make bigger scale ideas oh that that's that is a a big thing because you your brain is only going to be as good as so much while 10 people that are working on a bigger project like a scripted tv show or something like that are going to be able to bring so much more to the table and just help you develop something or know something that you might not even realize because being a YouTuber you don't know you you might know a few things like instinctively about how I don't know a story structure works but someone that's been a script writer for 10 years could come in and have ideas and just completely blow your mind and change the whole thing so I think it's really exciting that traditional media and online personalities are finding ways to work together and make make things and I think the things that they're going to make are going to be better than if it was just completely separate and Phil bring it back to your audience what do you think is the main thing that they value in you as a creator um I'm not sure I think I'd like to think it's authenticity like I, I I like to think I'm authentic in the videos and in person and I try to be nice to everyone so it 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 could be that and just I think when someone's been watching my videos for a while, it, it it does feel like they're my friend in a way. So I feel like it's just more of a level playing field than, I don't know, say someone that is a movie star or a pop star that's a, a bit more inaccessible. 
So I think it, it might be that that they value more. And I read in an interview that you did quite recently about kind of keeping inspired and sort of keeping your content fresh. How do you kind of come up with new ideas considering that you've been on YouTube for such a long time? Well, yeah, I'm 14 years in now. So it's like <laughs> when I'm like, oh, what can my next video be? I think it's, I, I, I just make things firstly that I'd want to watch. So I think what would make me laugh or what what could I do? And I'm, I've am i been branching out a bit more with different ideas this year. Like my last video, I went to one of those um, sensory deprivation tank pods where you go for a different mindset. And I was kind of reviewing the whole experience. I don't think I was, was going to take my phone into the pod with me, <laughs> which I would not recommend because it's so salty water and it can ruin your phone it's because I dropped it in the tank. Oh, no. But <laughs> uh, that made for an entertaining video. Um, so, yeah, it's just maybe pushing the boundaries a bit and trying new things and also seeing what other creators are making. I don't think there's any shame in say, seeing someone else's video and thinking, oh, I could do my own take on that. Um, so I've done, I've done that like one where it was my birthday. I was like, I'm going to try and make a cake with no ingredients, which sounds like a really silly idea, but it turned into a very entertaining video and I got a slightly edible cake out of it. So win-win. Win-win. Yeah. <laughs> so when you say that you um, still look to other creators, is there anyone in particular that you look to? Um, I, I really like the Sophia Nygaard videos. I, when, when she makes a video, it's just the detail that she goes into. Like you can tell there's so much research and planning, even if it's quite a silly video, she's got all the facts and she'll go to all the locations and the resulting video is always very entertaining. Even if it's melting 20 candles into one candle, I'm like, wow, I know everything about candles and I also want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got to meet her the last VidCon, as that was nice to hang out with her as well. Right. Yeah. And what about, is there anything in traditional media that inspires you? Um, I've always inspired by traditional media. Like I watch so many TV shows and movies and there's, there's always stuff that you're going to pick up on that you're like, that is a brilliant idea. Um, for a long time, Scott Pilgrim versus the world, that movie, I was like, I want to make a movie like this. This, if, if that was my movie, that, that would be it because there's so many tricks they do in editing to bring to life the footage that I loved so much. So if you're ever thinking, if you've not seen it, I would definitely recommend that from an editing perspective, just to see all the little effects and video game references and stuff. It was just incredible. And I sometimes find when I, because I, I work in TV, yeah. it sometimes like takes away the magic because you're then looking at thinking like, oh, that's yeah. an interesting editing. And, it, <laughs> edit. and then you think, oh, well, I'm so, sort of looking at this through the lens of sort of like a scientist as opposed to a creator. Do you find yourself doing that? Um, I, I can, I'm quite good at suspending disbelief. If a movie's good, then I'll, I'll get into it. And I think it's a good sign if you're lost in that world, you know that it's a good movie. Like, um, what was it, 1917? When I watched that, I completely forgot I was in the cinema. I was just like, I am here. I'm going to get shot. This is crazy. Um, so I, I think it's more when I'm watching my own videos, I can't, I find it really hard to watch it as a viewer. I find I, I'm so critical of myself and I just see the edits and I'm like, oh, that could be different. Oh, that could be different. And even if after I've uploaded it, I, I'll get a text from my friend and they're like, oh, that was so funny. But in my head, I'm like, oh, but I could have cut two seconds off that bit. So I think I think I should learn and other people should learn not to be so critical of yourself because there can be a point where I, like, I made a, a video in December and I was looking back at the footage. I was like, I can't upload this. This isn't this isn't good enough. But then I just persevered with the editing and it turned out to be really funny. But that self-doubt was creeping and like, people aren't going to watch this. People aren't going to like this. So yeah, I need to work on that a bit and just think if people are enjoying my videos, then I should be able to <laughs> enjoy them as well. And I was going to say, have you ever applied that sort of analytical um, kind of opinion on the numbers in your channel? Because I know for quite a lot of creators, they can become quite numbers obsessed to the detriment of creativity it's so hard not to be numbers obsessed like when you log into youtube if anyone here's got a youtube channel there's a thing that pops up and says this video is not performing as well as your other ones <laughs> and you're like oh, great well, that's that's thanks that's youtube a, thanks youtube that's a great boost <laughs> in fact this many people didn't watch it and this many people unsubscribed so it's 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 really <laughs> that is a bit like you don't you don't want to get that feeling when you first log into your channel to be just like numbers are in your face and you can't really avoid it. So I think any anyone that is a content creator is going to look at a video and think, oh, that one did really well. And that's a nice feeling. But then if one doesn't do as well, you'll be like, oh, I wonder why. But you've got to see it as a learning thing rather than a everybody hates me. Because like in a few months, 
more people to watch another one. And then you've also got to think of those viewers. Like, if a thousand people watch a video, that's that's a thousand people. Imagine a thousand people in the room with you. I, and I think you should just think of it as this amount of people appreciated what I did. And it doesn't matter if it's a thousand or two thousand. In the end, people are appreciating your work. So it's still worth it. I was um, with another content creator the other day, which I won't say who it was, but yeah. he's, he's adorable. And he's just dipped below 100,000. And he was like, do I have to send my plaque back? Oh, no. like, <laughs> <laughs> just send it back in the, in the Yeah, exactly. And it was like, well, you know, you have them at some point. So yeah. do you, when you've um, uploaded a video, do you, do you then let it go? So you're saying you're very self-critical yeah. during the editing phase, but once it's out in the world, do you feel like you can... Once, I've, once it's out in the world, I kind of just let it go. I... I I don't, I don't obsess over it. So if one's done slightly worse or one's done slightly better, I'm not obsessed over it. Um, I think it's more, I'm more critical in the editing process and actually like pressing go rather than the numbers after the fact. Phil, do you have a video that you're like particularly proud of? Ooh, particularly proud of. Um, I mean, I made a coming out video, so that I'm, I'm proud of that because the the reaction that I got to that was completely unexpected and. I had people that were messaging me saying that helped them come out or that helped them deal with their sexuality. So on a personal level, I mean, the, the video production wasn't incredible, but the actual message behind the video, I was really proud of that one. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you, well, I don't know, to speak for you. Yeah. Could you, <laughs> could you imagine you were here now, like when you started in 2006? No, I'd probably run away if if you if I had like <laughs> if you showed me some kind of crystal ball and I was sat even in front of this amount of people, I think I would have I, I I just wouldn't have been able to do it. I was I was so shy and anxious. I couldn't even like phone for a hairdresser's appointment. I was that like nervous about public interaction and talking and stuff like that. So the fact that I've got to this level now where I can go on stage or I can talk at a panel, it's just it's kind of mind blowing looking back at where I was. So yeah, I'm proud of myself for that. And if we did have a crystal ball to look in the future, <laughs> where where do you see yourself going? Oh my goodness. That's that's the thing. I, I think I've reached a point where I'm ready to sink my teeth into a new big project um, because we did the tours and we had the gaming channel and I'm ready to do something new that's also very Phil and very my own thing. So... I've been looking into, I'm really obsessed with interactivity. Um, I think there's been a big boom of it since Bandersnatch, which was the Black Mirror interactive Netflix show. But I was making interactive videos like 10 years ago with YouTube annotations. They had ways that you could click through to different videos. So I was making my own adventures and stories and quizzes using that. And I think now broadcasters and traditional people are being excited about that technology. I'm thinking, how could that be used? Because that's something that really excites me. And having narrative structures that could have different endings or you are put under time pressure to do something. Um, so I, I already pitched one like interactive thing which didn't work out, but I've got a lot of other ideas that I'm thinking of. And I'm excited to see how other different creators are doing it. Like I know Markiplier just did one as a YouTube original. And I also saw there's one, I think it's called The Complex, and it's actually a games console, like a, a video game, but it's a movie and you control how the movie goes using your games console. And I've no, I haven't seen that before either. So I think there's some innovative ways that I could branch out, which I'm not sure about yet, but I've got a lot of ideas in my head. In, in um, When you mentioned about pitching and things not going, yeah. um, not always getting a yes, that's, I feel like it's the story of my life and my job, <laughs> like coming up with ideas for them to... Do, do you still enjoy that process of learning from pitching yeah i think it would be weird to always have someone say yes about everything so i think it's good to get feedback on an idea and they say oh we're not looking for it for this reason but that doesn't mean you can't mold that idea into something else or change half of it and then pitch it again to the same people or pitch it to different people so i think it's always about not taking someone saying no as some kind of attack or big negative thing and just thinking okay well how can we work on this or how can we change it or what can we use that's good from this into something else we get that a lot in terms of it might it's a no because it's not right now yeah, yeah. it's like the world isn't ready for your idea yet yeah. you just need to wait for the work you know it's, it's just like what time is a good time for that that's project to happen and also different people will they'll have like one space for something that's sci-fi and they'll have one space for a comedy and they might have already filled that slot but they're not going to tell you what they've 
already got on, under their belt. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> under something. Uh, so <laughs> they, uh, they're they not going to tell you. So you, you're kind of sh- shooting your shot and they might think, oh, that's a great idea, but we've just commissioned one of those anyway. So that's something I'm learning. And it's been a very different experience sending off a pitch and going through that process than just making my own stuff and like like with the tour producing it myself and just doing it all myself and obviously you talked about doing some scripted concepts in the live show would you like to do some more longer form scripted maybe in film or I'd, I'd love to i with i think i i don't think i'd be the star of the film if i if i made one i'd very much be interested in writing something um so i'm excited just to see where that takes me and where that creative process goes Um, because I've written a few short stories and I've I've tried like a a bit of a long form script but it's all just ideas and before as I'm a control freak it's perfect I'm not going to release it into the wild yet and how do you find managing that with still uploading yeah um it's it's I've seen it as more of a hobby than so I do my like YouTube work but then this kind of scripting and things like that has been a bit of a hobby so far and I'm not under a deadline so I'm quite used to being under a deadline for something because obviously YouTube, you're like, I've got to make a video because it's been a week or I've got to do this. But with this, I'm just like, no, it's my free flowing creativity. I'll just let it go where it takes me. Like when I did a book that was July the 1st, we have to have the whole thing written. And if it's not written, then there's no book. So that's that was a different kind of creativity, which sometimes in a way, you know, when you do an exam and you revise the night before, sometimes if you know there is a deadline then that can spark so much more creativity because i think the stress and the adrenaline it's like oh here we go i'm creative now because i have to be (laughs) so helen you need to say phil you've got a deadline (laughs) i'll I'll send you something i want it yeah (laughs) i was was gonna mention actually with your books you had um an illustrator that had worked on the mighty boosh didn't you dave yes yeah yeah so he illustrated to your brief is that how it worked um he is such a creative man so we gave him a brief of what we wanted the page to look like and a vibe or a mood board and he would just deliver every time and it was so rare that we'd see one of his pages and be like no because everyone he delivered was amazing so it was such a such a dream to work with him and he was really excited about the book as well and just he loves collages and montages and things like that and the fact that it was everything from our videos all piled into one book he was just having a great time yeah I think we've got time for one more question. Um, it's it's something that we like to ask everyone that we interview. Um, yes. Is there a piece of work or a talent at the moment that's like really stood out for you or that's really inspiring you? Ooh, a piece of work. Um, it could be a TV show, it could be a podcast. Yeah, well, I think b- based on what I'm inspired by, I would say that the Bandersnatch Netflix show really did inspire me. Um, just based on the technology and how it worked and how there was multiple endings and things like that. So that was truly inspirational. And then How many I, times did you go through it? I, w- I went through like all of it. I, <laughs> I, 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 I went through all the endings. My only, actually, my I thought it should have ended and had like, this is the end and then you try again because I think there was a lot of trying again, not realizing it had already ended, if you know what I mean. So I think everyone ended up going through it because they didn't know they'd reached the end already. I said end a lot of times then, hopefully that made sense. <laughs> uh, so I'd say that has inspired me. I still keep Scott Pilgrim in my heart and also Gremlins Gizmo. Gizmo's the one. Aww. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for chatting to us. I think um, personally what really always sets you apart, Phil, is your attention to detail on, on creativity. I know when we at BBC Studios worked with Dan and Phil on their tour, just the amount of effort you had gone into for your community's experience in terms of th- designing the merch to the experience for a fan to come and not fan sorry for the, okay. aud- the audience the people <laughs> some people to come into the room it was just actually second to none i feel like you're unrivaled in the british online content scene oh, and thanks. i'm just so excited to see what you do in the future oh thank you thanks for having me and thanks everyone for coming as well oh, yeah, thank you. Okay. enjoy the rest of vidcon Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the TalentWorks podcast. For more interviews like these, click the subscribe button and you'll be notified when our next conversation goes live. Or you can follow us on Instagram at BBC Studios TalentWorks. See you next time.